good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's update. I'm joined today by the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Fair Work and Culture, Fiona Hislop, and by our National Clinical Director, Professor Jason Leach. Let me start, as always, uh, with an update on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,327 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 39 since yesterday. A total of 1,216 patients are in hospital with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That represents a total decrease of 22 from yesterday, but includes a decrease of 28 in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 40 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That is an increase of three since yesterday. Now, we shouldn't read anything into that increase. These figures do fluctuate and will fluctuate uh, day to day. But nevertheless, it is a reminder that the virus has not gone away. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,640 patients who had tested positive and required uh, hospitalisation have now been able to leave hospital, and I'm sure we uh, wish all of them well. Unfortunately, though, I also have to report that in the last 24 hours, 15 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having COVID-19, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,331. We mustn't ever lose sight of the fact that these numbers are not just statistics, they represent individuals whose deaths are being mourned by friends, family and loved ones. And I want to send my condolences again today to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. Let me also thank, as I always do, our health and care workers. For the 10th Thursday in a row last night, people across the country joined together to applaud your efforts and show our deep gratitude to you. There are two items I want to cover today. Uh, firstly, I want to recap on the changes to the lockdown restrictions on social interaction and leisure that I announced yesterday and that have taken effect today. I'm very conscious that this weekend will be the first in quite some time that people will be able to meet up. And so I want to take the time to outline once again what the changes are and also the rules that you must follow to stay safe and avoid a resurgence of the virus. From today, you and your household can meet with another household out of doors. That can be in a park or in a private garden. However, you should limit the total number of people meeting up to a maximum of eight. Ideally, it should be less than that. You should not meet with more than one household at a time. And please don't meet with more than one other household per day. If you do meet up, you need to be outside and you need to stay at least two metres away from people in the other household. You should also try to avoid touching the same hard surfaces. For example, if you're having a picnic or a barbecue this weekend, as I'm sure many of you will be planning to do, not only should you stay two metres apart from uh, members of the other household, but each household should bring its own food, cutlery, plates and cups. And please don't go indoors. Being in someone else's house should still be avoided unless you're providing support to somebody who is vulnerable. Now, we're not putting a legal limit on how far you can travel to meet another household, but if the distance is so far that you would have to, for example, use someone else's bathroom, then don't go. Again, to be clear, uh, these rules are for a reason, and it's important that everybody understands the reasons because it then helps you apply uh, judgment uh, to different situations. Uh, and the reasons are this. We know that if you go inside a house uh, or indoors, or if you come within two metres of people in other households, or if you touch the same surfaces as another household, then that creates opportunities for the virus to spread. And all of us must continue to do everything possible to avoid that happening. Uh, from today, you're also able to sit or sunbathe in parks and open areas. And I suspect many of you that would normally be watching this update are doing exactly that right now. Uh, you are able to travel, preferably by walking or cycling for recreation, but please stay within or close to your own local area and don't travel more than around five miles from your home. Uh, we don't want to see large numbers of people at tourist hotspots or local beauty spots. So if you do go somewhere and you find that it is already crowded, then change your plans and perhaps go somewhere else instead. 
Um, if you haven't done so already, and I suspect a lot of you already have, but if you haven't, I would urge you to go on to the Scottish Government's website at www.gov.scot and read the guidance that we published yesterday, because that sets out the rules and the parameters that we are asking you to follow. I I really hope and I expect that these changes will bring some real improvement to the quality of our lives. But, and this is a point I need to continue to stress, they are deliberately and by necessity cautious changes and they have been very carefully considered and assessed. Now I said yesterday that I was nervous ahead of these changes and I have to tell you that that is still the case. And the reason for that is this. If too many of us change our behaviour a bit more than these changes are designed to allow, then we could see the virus spread quickly again, and that would take us back to square one. And the consequences of that would be measured not just in more time spent in lockdown and some of these restrictions that we've just lifted being applied again, but the consequences would also be measured in lost lives. So I'm not trying at all to cramp anyone's fun this weekend. I really do want everyone to enjoy these changes because all of you have more than earned it. But I am asking you to please do so responsibly. I'm appealing to your judgment and to your sense of solidarity to each other. Please stay within the rules. Apply judgment. We can't obviously give bespoke guidance for every single individual circumstance. But if you remember that the purpose of the rules is to deny the virus bridges to jump across, then you yourselves can decide whether or not what you are thinking about doing is sensible or not. Uh, so continue to limit the people from other households that you see. Stay distant, be rigorous in your hand hygiene, and don't allow the virus to spread from you to someone else via a hard surface. And generally, if you find yourself wondering whether or not it's OK to do something this weekend, consider whether you might, in doing that, be providing that bridge for the virus to jump across. And my main message to you would be this. If you are in doubt about whether your plans are within the rules or not, err for now on the side of caution. Because however harsh these rules might feel right now, and I know that they do, abiding by them will never, ever be as harsh as grieving the loss of a loved one. So please, uh, before you make any plans, stop, think and protect yourselves and your families. Now, the second item I want to briefly cover this morning relates to the economy. Uh, this morning, as I do every Friday morning, I chaired the Cabinet Subcommittee on the Economy. And among the items we discuss with our support for business and particularly for industries that are not yet able to reopen, one of those is, of course, our manufacturing sector, and that's what I want to briefly touch on now. We know, and always have known, that manufacturing is vital to Scotland. But that fact has been underlined in the past couple of months. In that time, manufacturers across the country have stepped forward to help our response to this crisis. Many have repurposed or scaled up their operations to meet demand for things like hand sanitizer and PPE. And in doing that, they have helped us to provide our frontline services with the supplies that they need. So I want to thank everyone who has contributed to that effort and thank the many manufacturing businesses not involved in that essential work who have remained closed. I know how tough things are for you at the moment, and I appreciate the sacrifices that you are making. Unfortunately, most of our manufacturing businesses will not be able to reopen until phase two of our route map. However, during this first phase, they will be able to start preparations for a safe return to work. And earlier this week, we published guidance for the sector on the measures that will need to be in place. We're determined to support our manufacturing industry as it prepares for that restart. Uh, we want to do everything we can to secure and ensure its future success. That was already a priority before this virus, but it comes even more important as the industry and our economy generally recovers. That's why I'm announcing today that we are providing an additional £20 million of funding for Scotland's new National Manufacturing Institute, bringing our total investment as government to £75 million. I can also confirm today that the contract to build the new institute has been awarded, though of course work will only commence when it is safe to do so. 
The National Manufacturing Institute will be operated by the University of Strathclyde and it will bring together expertise from academia and industry. It will allow businesses of all sizes to access research and development and ensure that Scotland remains at the forefront of advanced manufacturing. Uh, we also want to improve the support available to manufacturers uh, at a local level across the country. So we're also announcing today investment in 12 new projects, uh, each of them designed to help small and medium-sized businesses, and the Cabinet Secretary will set out more detail shortly. Uh, we know that a strong manufacturing sector is vital to our economic success. So by investing now, we're preparing our economy for the challenges, but also the opportunities of the post-COVID world. For now, of course, our primary focus is on dealing with this crisis. Uh, we have made significant progress in recent weeks. There is no doubt about that. But make no mistake, the virus hasn't gone away. So before I hand over to the Cabinet Secretary, I want to just set out for you once again what the rules are. Uh, let me be clear, you should still stay at home as much as you can. Lockdown has been modified. It is not over. You should still be seeing far fewer people than you would normally do. Don't meet up with more than one other household at a time. Don't meet more than one a day and keep to a maximum of eight people in a group. Stay two metres apart when you do meet. I know how difficult that will be. We all want to hug our loved ones, but please don't put them or yourself at risk. Wash your hands often. Take hand sanitizer with you if you're out and about. Avoid hard surfaces and clean any that you do touch. And remember, if you have symptoms of the virus, get tested and follow the advice on self-isolation. And above all, remember that each and every individual decision that we take will affect the safety and the well-being of everyone. Uh, recent weeks have been really tough, the toughest any of us, uh, most of us, can ever remember. And I can't tell you that there's not tough times still lying ahead. But I can also tell you this, I have never been prouder of this country than I am right now. So let's continue to stick together and let's continue to do right by each other. And remember, at all stages, stop, think and protect. So thank you in advance for doing that. And let me wish you all, within the rules, of course, a happier and certainly a sunnier weekend than we've had for some time. Uh, let me hand over now to the Economy Secretary uh, to say uh, a few words and give a bit more detail on the announcements I've touched upon before I hand over to Professor Leach. Fiona. First of all, can I thank all the businesses and workers in the critical infrastructure sectors for continuing to work for, to help the country keep going. And I know that restarting the economy more widely is important for all of those looking for more certainty for the future of their jobs and their businesses. But unless phase one works safely, businesses in later phases won't be able to open. In response to the crisis, we have set out a unique package of business support totalling £2.3 billion, designed to reflect the specific needs of the Scottish economy. And on Tuesday, I announced plans to extend eligibility to give more support to a wider range of smaller businesses across Scotland. Our priority now is a carefully phased return and getting back to work in a safe and controlled way. We've published guidance uh, this week to support safe working in retail, manufacturing, transport, construction and uh, waste. And today we'll be publishing guidance on forestry and environmental management to support the restart of work in our outdoor landscapes. And Food Standards Scotland is publishing updated guidance that we expect takeaway and drive through businesses to follow when restarting activity here in Scotland. Reflecting our fair work principles, all the guidance has been developed in partnership with employers and trade unions. This is essential to give businesses and workers confidence that it will be safe to go back to work when the time is right. But we need to plan and look to the future of our economy. And I can also announce today that the Advanced Manufacturing Challenge Fund will support 12 projects across Scotland to deliver free local support to manufacturing SMEs. In total, including match funding, those projects will receive investment of £15.8 million. So each project is led by a local authority, uh, an academic institution or a third sector organisation. 
Projects are targeted at developing technologies or skills of use across multiple manufacturing sectors. Others focus on specific manufacturing sectors to boost Scotland's existing considerable strengths from healthcare to low carbon energy and to aerospace. Together, I believe that they will help more of our manufacturers to succeed. So this, along with our investment in the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland, will complement investment in other sectors, such as Construction Scotland's Innovation Centre, which is leading work to support the sector through COVID and to adapt for a green, resilient future, which will be critical for our longer term recovery. So for the good of our economy, we need phase one to work safely. Thank you very much, Fiona, and I'll hand over now to Professor Leach. Thank you, First Minister. So today does feel like a more hopeful day of these past few weeks, but it also is making me anxious, just as it's making the First Minister anxious. This is phase one. The timing of phase two is in no way guaranteed. Let me try and put that in perspective for you. Today, there are 800 people in hospital with this disease. There are 40 families living with the trauma of a loved one in an intensive care unit today with this disease. And today, care teams around the country will have to tell families that their loved one has died of this disease. So do not take phase one lightly. Please do not take phase one lightly. I talked last week, and I'm going to do it again, about the five things that have not changed. And these five things become even more important now that lockdown has been released in this limited way. So number one, regularly and thoroughly wash your hands for 20 seconds. Number two, keep at least two metres from people outside your own household. As a side issue, that is the only sure way of not being a contact when a tracer phones you. You will not have to self-isolate if you haven't been within two metres of anybody else, unless it is somebody in your own household. Number three, Avoid touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth because you can spread the virus. Number four, cough etiquette. So if you're going to sneeze or cough, do it into your elbow or do it into a hanky. Discard it and wash your hands. And finally, number five, clean surfaces regularly and thoroughly because touching the infected surface can pass it on to you or to others. Remember, if you have symptoms, go to nhsinform.scot and book a test and a contact tracer, if your test is positive, will be in touch. If you don't have digital access, then phone 0800 028 2816. If you deteriorate or are worried, the health service is available for you, and you phone 111 if that happens. My final brief point is about physical exercise. We have, in phase one, allowed unrestricted non-contact exercise in your local area. We ask you continue to use good judgment, however, if you take part in activities that are perhaps slightly more dangerous than have been in the last few weeks. So hiking, canoeing, other areas where you may be used to doing it, please keep within your current capabilities. So don't try things for the first time just as we're coming out of lockdown. We want the people of Scotland to be able to safely enjoy our environment, but we, do want, we don't want inadvertently to put pressure on our emergency and voluntary services. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it more challenging for organisations such as Scottish Mountain Rescue and RNLI to train enough volunteers. So we ask that over the weeks ahead, please continue to use good judgement for your own safety and the safety of those who might have to come and rescue you if you didn't perhaps follow those guidelines. First Minister. Thank you very much, Jason. We'll move on now straight to questions. The first question today is from... Gordon Cree from STV. Before now, when the rules have been pretty much black and white, many of us have been aware either anecdotally or seeing it of people ignoring those rules, lack of social distancing, gathering in bigger groups, even going into houses. Now you're asking people to exercise a degree of judgment even within families, there will be disputes over what that judgment allows and doesn't. What level of non-compliance have you factored in to being able to make these changes safely? Uh, look, we always work on the basis that the vast majority of people will do the right thing. 
Uh, we're never going to get 100% compliance with every single aspect of this all of the time, although I would like to do that, so I would encourage everybody to try to contribute to it. But my experience over uh, the past uh, two months uh, or more now is that the vast majority of people have done the right thing. Uh, so that, yes, of course, we have all seen uh, directly or seen through pictures on the media instances of, of people flouting the rules, but they have been in the minority. They've been in the tiny minority and the enforcement statistics that the police would cite would underline that as well. And, and sometimes where people uh, are perhaps flouting the rules, they're not doing it deliberately, it's maybe a misunderstanding. Uh, so the vast majority of people uh, are doing the right thing and I believe will continue to do the right thing. And it, it comes down to uh, a, simple, uh, a simple message. The more of us that do that, the more successful we will be. And, and what I'm not going to do is say, well, we can afford to have X percent not complying because that would uh, lead all of us to think, well, it doesn't matter if I don't comply. It matters. Every single one of us here has a responsibility and we have a responsibility to ourselves, to the people we love most, but to our wider communities and to the country. Never before in my lifetime has that need for collective uh, action and a sense of solidarity mattered more. And I continue to appeal to that and I continue to be heartened and encouraged. Uh, and at times, you know, over the past few weeks, it, I touch emotional sometimes at seeing how well people have, have responded. So my, my appeal to people is keep doing that because it is working and we are making the progress that we need to make. Uh, David Henderson, BBC. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. you Thank you, First Minister. A lot of people yeah. might be tempted this weekend not so much to break the rules, but to bend them a bit by going for a drive or for example, hugging a member of their family who they haven't seen for months. These are going to be the, the difficult choices that people make. What do you say to people who might be tempted to bend the rules? Please don't, because you will be putting the person you love, the person that you are uh, desperate to hug, potentially at risk. And I mean, I understand, you know, I'm not somehow apart from these instincts. Uh, and in some ways, if I think about my own circumstances, you know, it's been hard staying away from family. It's been hard not seeing, you know, my mum and dad, for example. But I also think in some ways it might be harder to be able to see them but not give them a hug. So, you know, this is really tough. But I come back to the point, we're not putting these rules in place just to make your life difficult or to, you know, get in the way of you enjoying the weekend and enjoying the sunshine. This really, really matters. So please abide by these rules because every time one of us doesn't, we offer that bridge that the virus can jump across. And if it jumps across one bridge, then you know somebody else might create another one. And before we know it, we've got exponential growth of the virus again, and we're back to square one. So please just keep doing the right things, difficult though they are, for the right reasons, and we will keep moving forward, and we will keep making progress. And in a few weeks, we might be standing here talking about going into phase two. So um, yeah, I know how difficult it is, but it's really important that everybody sticks to it. And I come back to this, just think about things. Um, my, when I talk about being a bit nervous, that's what I'm nervous about. Not people deliberately flouting the rules, because I don't think the majority of people will, will do that. But people thinking that they've got a bit more license to do things than we have actually given. Uh, so stop before you do anything. Think about it. Think about some of the things we've said that can create or alternatively stop bridges opening up for the virus and have that necessity to protect people in your mind. So when we talk about two metres distant, washing your hands, staying outdoors, these are how you protect people. So please, please, please do all of these things and we'll keep moving in the right direction. Do you want to add anything? Uh, only the context for this, is, I think, is the individual responsibility versus the population responsibility. So if I take a paracetamol for a headache, you don't care. That, that only matters to me for my headache. My behaviour now affects you, and your behaviour potentially affects me. That's the big difference. So even though you think it is low risk because you've worked out that maybe you don't have the virus and the family don't have the virus, and you don't know. And what you do might affect them and might affect people around them, and so it goes on. It's like a family tree of virus. It goes all the way through and you might be the one to start it. So that individual behaviour against population responsibility is the crucial element of public health. And I think the population in Scotland have understood that over the last two months, three months, and I think they will continue to understand it. Absolutely. 
it's about just not creating these bridges. And that's why we say only one household at a time. Because if, you know, with the best will in the world, uh, all of these protections don't work and the virus spreads from one household to another, if you're not then meeting other households, then there's a, a bit of a fire break in that transmission. So always think of it in terms of what can you do that stops the virus spreading? Because we are all on one side of this, the virus is on the other side, and to beat it, we've got to stop it uh, transmitting. And that means thinking about every single thing we do. Fraser Knight from Global. First Minister, we're expecting to hear from the Chancellor later on about his expansion of funding for um, for businesses in the UK during this pandemic. But there are concerns that he might not extend support for people who are self-employed. If indeed this afternoon he doesn't extend that support, what will the Scottish Government do to, to make sure that thousands of self-employed people in Scotland still are able to continue without being back at work? I'm going to hand over to uh, the Economy Secretary, but can I say I, I hope there is uh, support for the self-employed. The Scottish Government will always do everything uh, we can, but it is the UK Government that still holds the, uh, the, the main economic levers and the borrowing power, so we need them to continue to act in the right way, as they have in the main been doing. So I, I hope we hear positive news later on today, but uh, Fiona has been obviously corresponding with the Treasury and engaged in a number of discussions around this, so I'll hand over to her. Yes, the UK government have to use their powers responsibly. The job retention scheme was welcomed, but uh, the changes that might be proposed, and we're here later on this afternoon, could cause some difficulties. And I will be writing to the Chancellor to make sure that he understands the needs of Scotland's economy, and particularly those areas, for example, in the tourism and oil and gas sector, uh, which may take longer to recover. When it comes to the self-employed scheme, remember the UK self-employed scheme has just opened and just as he has extended the job retention scheme until October, certainly uh, that should be the same for the self-employed scheme. But of course the self-employed scheme by the UK, from the UK government didn't cover everybody and that is why the Scottish government uh, stepped in to help the newly self-employed because that was a gap that the UK scheme uh, hadn't covered. So we want people to be able to carry out their Professions. We want the self-employed, who are an important part of growing Scotland's economy, to have that security until such times as their particular sector uh, can, can, can restart and restart safely. So uh, there's a lot of pressure on the UK government. They know that. Uh, we constantly talk to them about improvements, and sometimes they make those improvements. But certainly extending the self-employed scheme is one of the improvements that the UK government should make. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, Dan Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thank you very much, First Minister. Um, you've said you're nervous about um, how people are, are going to react to the changes. I, I just wonder if you've had any, I know it's still early, but if you've had any updates maybe from Police Scotland or Transport Scotland on you know how people have, have behaved this morning. Um, and also, you said earlier in the pandemic that mixed messages could potentially uh, cost lives. But isn't there a danger? You're now um, promoting mixed messages by continuing to stand in front of the stay-at-home podium, but also telling people to enjoy the, the new freedoms and going outdoors. Thank you. Um, on that latter point, no, I don't think so. And this was raised at, at the briefing yesterday, and I've tried to be very clear. Our uh, sort of foundational default advice remains stay at home as much as you can. Uh, the... Uh, changes we announced yesterday extended some of the exceptions to that. There have always been exceptions to it, going for food and, and medicine, exercise, um, and going to essential work if you can't do that essential work from home. So now we've extended some of those exceptions, but when you're not doing any of these things, the advice is still to stay at home. Undoubtedly, that message will evolve over the next few weeks, but it's really important that we recognise at this stage that the changes uh, to the uh, regulations are minimal, small, careful and gradual. So the stay-at-home message that's in front of me right now still is extremely important. Um, and on, in relation to reports I've had this morning, I've had nothing uh, drawn to my attention this morning that, that uh, causes or justifies or, or substantiates the, the nerves that I keep speaking about. Um, and hopefully that will be the case over the weekend. I, I have huge confidence that people want to do the right thing here. But equally, I, I understand the frustration, the pent-up frustration people have, uh, have you know, being indoors and not being able to do certain things. So um, that's why I'm just 
constantly repeating uh, this advice. Enjoy the limited changes, but don't go further than that. And don't forget uh, the, the ways in which you need to protect yourself, uh, your loved ones and the country as a whole. Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on some comments from a GP based in Glasgow, Dr Margaret McCartney, today. Um, she warns that test, trace and isolate could end up doing more harm than good uh, because the rate of false negatives from tests uh, could be up to 30%. She says this could obviously lead to people going back to work and into the community um, if their COVID-19 infection does go undetected. Can you say what the rate of false negative is from this test? And is this something that you have concerns about? Um, well, I've not seen uh, Dr McCartney's comments. I'm not going to comment on them in any detail. Uh, Dr McCartney is a very respected GP and uh, a GP that I've got uh, the utmost respect for. So I would always listen to, to what she had to say um, and will uh, look at her comments. But can I just say briefly, um, on this right now, test and protect is really important. But I have anybody who has listened to me talk about this uh, over the past weeks will always have heard me say it can never be seen in isolation. It is part of the overall approach we have to take. Uh, so social distancing, physical distancing, rather the, the hygiene advice we give, all of that is, is vitally important. Test and protect will not beat this virus for us on its own. You will also have heard me, and I think you've probably challenged me actually, uh, understandably on this uh, at previous briefings, you've heard me talk about the, the need to keep testing in context as well, that it is really, really important, but there will always be uh, limitations in terms of the reliability of testing, particularly for people who aren't displaying symptoms. So I suppose what I would say overall is that we mustn't ever think that the, the fight against this virus it has one single magic uh, solution to it. It involves us doing all sorts of things, testing, test and protect. These are all important parts of it, but unless we all do the other things that we're advising, then none of these individual parts of the overall approach will have the desired effect. So that's, uh, I think, the most important message I would convey. Do you want to add? Uh, maybe a little on the test itself. I, I have often said this test is not perfect. If this test finds virus, it is pretty much perfect. It is almost 100% sensitive if it finds virus particles, even remnants of virus some days after symptoms. The false negative rate that Dr. McCartney talks about is around the sampling, the challenge with some sampling. So if you're very elderly, if you're in a care home with dementia, or if you're very young, if you're a child, that sampling can get more difficult, just, just technically more difficult for the clinical teams to be able to do. So there is always a false negative rate in, in every test, from chest x-rays to blood tests to coronavirus tests. But it's important to remember there are a lot of positives. So those positives are the ones we're using in the main in our test and protect system. So, so to suggest we shouldn't do that because we miss some, I think misses the point. We should of course get that sampling as reliable as it can possibly be and also isolate those positives if they're positive. Um, but those are two different things. So isolate the positives and get the test as reliable as you possibly can. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, Tom Martin from the Daily Express. Hi, good, after Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, First Minister. Um, just going back to the test and protect, on Tuesday when you were asked about the sort of possibility of um, fraudsters trying to exploit the, the, the cold call system. You indicated that we may, you, you, there may be some more details on identity verification coming. I just wondered, um, have we got an update on that? What, what measures might be getting taken on that issue? Yeah, so Health Protection Scotland uh, and others have been looking very carefully at this. And as we go through the marketing of Test and Protect, obviously some of this uh, detail will be conveyed to people. But there are steps that will be taken, uh, you know, whether that is about making sure it's identifiable, num identifiable numbers that are called from, uh, the ability for somebody to call back uh, the system, uh, having a text message in advance to say that you're going to be called. These are the kind of uh, protections that are being built in so that people have confidence that when they get a call from a contact tracer, it is a legitimate contact tracer and you should follow the advice. Yeah, uh, only the other thing is you get a barcode when you get the test. So, so you, you will only know because you've got the barcode for the test. 
it would be it would be a fairly random act for a, a fraudster to phone tens of thousands of people and randomly find one that had had a positive test. But there will be there will be checks at each of those moments with the contact tracers and the health protection teams. We're, we're aware of that. We do it already for tuberculosis. We're just going to ramp it up for coronavirus. Yeah, I think the worry probably that people have is more if you're if you're being phoned as a contact. Um, how do you know that the person is, is legitimate? The, the health service already, when it contacts people, has protections in place and we will build upon those. But the security of this system and the, the privacy and confidentiality of this system is really important. And we know that because uh, that's vital to making sure people have the confidence in it, which in turn is vital to it being as effective as we need it to be. Uh, Scott McNabb from The Scotsman. Uh, thank you, um, First Minister. Uh, members of the Scottish Government's advisory group on um, economic recovery told MSPs this morning that the um, emerging generation of Scottish teenagers could have their future working lives and careers irrevocably scarred as a result of the economic impact of this uh, crisis. I'm wondering, will this group be a particular focus of your economic recovery planning uh, what kind of support can the Scottish Government provide to help companies step up and allow this generation to get a vital foothold in the world of work? I'll hand over to Fiona, but just a very brief comment from me is the challenges that this virus has uh, created for us, both in a health sense and in an economic sense, are significant. Um, and there's no getting away from that. And they will take uh, an enormous effort to overcome in the, the months ahead. But we shouldn't see any of the kind of thing that you have rightly set out there and the advisory group are setting out there as inevitable. It's our job and our duty to try to make sure that we uh, protect people and allow people to overcome these challenges. And that is particularly true of, of young people, both young people who've missed out on school school education and younger people who are going into uh, the labour market and that will be a key focus of what we do in the period ahead but I'll ask Fiona to maybe add a bit of detail to that. Yes as I said in my uh, statement to the parliament on the economy this week we anticipate that young people and women uh, will suffer most uh, in the jobs market particularly because of the impact of Covid. Now, that means that we have to take special responsibility for, for these uh, particular groups of people. And certainly in terms of looking to the future, we're setting out and we will set out uh, with the advice from the Economic Advisory Group, uh, the charting of the future for Scotland's economy. But it must involve more digitisation and also a green recovery. And there are jobs and potential opportunities for young people there. So the skills and the training of young people for those new uh, future industries uh, are going to be vital as part of this. So I'll be working with uh, the Deputy First Minister, particularly in developing that skills and retraining and jobs opportunity. Now, we face this uh, in the financial crisis, although this, is, this crisis is of a different magnitude than that. And we had schemes to ensure there was adopt an apprentice, for example, but also uh, we scaled up a lot of those new job opportunities, particularly for young people. And we tackled it and we made sure that Scotland's youth unemployment was one of the lowest across the uh, European Union. So we are aware of it. We're determined that this generation will not lose out because of COVID, but that responsibility is not just on government, it's going to be in companies to help employ them and help them be part of that society for the future. Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Hi there. Um, now we've got Jason here, I want to return to the question that I asked on Monday, um, because I think we might have been talking at cross purposes. Um, I read out Jason's quote from Good Morning Scotland on the 10th of March, when he said, the science tells us there's nothing to be gained at this point with stopping large gatherings or closing schools. He went on to say his wife was going to stereophonics. And then he said, we have got to time this right. So you want to gradually increase the number of people over a very controlled period so that we get herd immunity in the community. Now, when I read that out, you suggested that he was speaking in some kind of abstract, but he says, we have got to time this right. Um, so, so who's we, who, who is he speaking for? And then on March 16th, a couple of days later, you said, some of the discussion around herd immunity has been deeply unfortunate. It has never been the policy of the Scottish government or any government to pursue a policy of allowing and wanting people to get this virus. This is despite Jason and Patrick Valance in the previous days both saying we want to increase the number of people infected to get herd immunity. I, I can't 
reconcile these two statements. Can, can you help? Um, I'll try to do so again. Um, rather than uh, do what is most important for me to do right now, which is continue to, to steer us uh, through this virus in the future. The herd, herd immunity is, is a technical scientific term. Um, and I think what you read out from me there is, is true. It has taken on a, a connotation over this debate uh, and has been, I think, uh, sort of we've got to a point where it is read and understood to mean that you know governments are just happy to let a virus run riot and and let people die from it. And I've been very clear, uh, and I'll be clear again today, that has never been the policy of the Scottish government. I mean, a vaccine, uh, if you get a vaccine, it will get you to a point potentially of herd immunity. So that's the point I'm making. It has absolutely, categorically, emphatically never been the policy of the Scottish government uh, to simply uh, do nothing to, to stop and limit this virus. The, the save lives part of uh, the the slogan we use has been there from the very outset and, and that's been the case and that will continue to be the case every step of the way. But I'll uh, let Jason uh, speak for himself since he is here. And I, I'm, I'm delighted to do so. I'm delighted you asked the question when I'm here rather than when I'm not. I, I think a number of things have been conflated. The, the first is any suggestion that any advisor, Sir Patrick, me, wants people to die during this pandemic, and therefore that will make the world a safer place. So any suggestion that that was what we wanted then or now is g just completely false, completely false, and, and upsetting, in, in fact. The, the suggestion that immunity will be helpful for the virus and the pandemic going forward is true and remains true. We just don't know what that immunity quite means yet. So five months in, we don't know if we get long-term immunity. We don't know if that immunity means you can't get reinfected, but it looks as though from the global evidence, you probably can't. But the other challenge in there is we don't know if you get the virus, whether you are able to pass it on to uninfected people. So I wish the herd immunity phrase hadn't grown this arms and legs that the First Minister describes. And if you watch the whole Channel 4 hour interview that I gave, there was a moment when I was asked, do you agree with Sir Patrick Vallance, the chief scientific advisor of the UK? And I, I said, yes, because Patrick Vallance is the chief scientific advisor of the UK and we've tried as much as possible to have consensual clinical advice and then judgment made by decision makers, not by me, by the decision makers. So, I, so I'm uh, uh, un, unusually sorry that that word has become something bigger than it was ever intended to be in those early interviews. I would remind you they were two and a half months ago. So things have moved on considerably, including the science. Okay. There are, obviously, that two other points I would make. One is we learn about this virus all the time. We know much more about it. And unfortunately, we know much more about the severity of it than we did at the, the outset. And secondly, every day almost we get... Um, you know, questions put to us understandably and perfectly legitimately uh, about if we'd done different things at different times, we might be facing different outcomes. It's, uh, I think, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of days in a row, you asked us about why didn't we follow some Swedish experts' advice and not have lockdown at all, because the virus will just take its course. And this brings me back to the key point. We take decisions based on the best information we have at the time with the best of intentions, and that is what we will continue to do every step of the way. Uh, Kate Foster from the Daily Mail. Thanks, First Minister. Um, you've mentioned that uh, public places like beaches and parks might become very crowded over the weekend. If that does happen, will the police be moving people on? Well, that's the police to determine how they uh, police uh, the, the situation right now and, and the extent to which they... Uh, use enforcement action. Obviously, the regulations have changed slightly and, and obviously they are aware of that, but it's not for me to, to tell the police what to do. Uh, my job is to try to appeal to the Scottish public not to allow these situations to arise. Uh, and so, again, I would say if, if you are going to a park or a beach, uh, which you are allowed to do, but if you get there and it is crowded, then come away, go a, at another time or go somewhere else. And, and that's because we know, even though... Uh, the, the risks of transmission outdoors are lower than they are indoors. They're not zero outdoors, but they are lower than indoors. Nevertheless, 
If you're in a crowded place, it's going to be harder to socially distance and those risks are higher than we think is acceptable at the moment. So please stay away from crowded places. Um, and that's really important advice. Uh, so if you, if you go somewhere and it's crowded, for your own sake, come away and don't stay there uh, any longer than necessary. David Ball from the Herald. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, as schools return with a blended learning programme, uh, councils will need to probably call on more teaching staff with smaller class sizes put in place. Are you confident that enough additional staff will be available? And is it likely that PSAs may have to help deliver lessons? And can I also ask if you've seen um, the reports of a 94-year-old woman living alone in Glasgow who was too scared to leave her home um, during the lockdown and didn't eat for five days? And that's obviously a very extreme case, but it's quite disturbing. I was just wondering if you were concerned some vulnerable people were being sort of missed out. I've, I'll take your questions in order. Uh, so on the education question, all of these things have been worked through by local authorities, obviously, with the support and, and guidance of the Scottish Government. And that will be looking at the, the, the physical adaptations that need to be made, but also the staffing requirements uh, in, in order to make sure that the, uh, all young people have the right input uh, fr from teachers. So the Deputy First Minister, through the Education Recovery Group, uh, will continue to oversee that work. Um, I've not seen in detail the report that you, you talk about. I, I saw a, a a quick headline of it just before I came in here. So um, it's certainly something I'll, I want to look at uh, in more depth. But yes, I, I, from the outset of this, I've had concerns, as every you know, right-minded person will have had, about vulnerable people possibly falling through the net. And we've done you know, so many things and will continue to do so many things to try to stop that happening. There has been you know, a very significant package of support and infrastructure of support put in place, uh, both for those who are in the shielded group, but also we established a helpline for people who are vulnerable but not in the shielded group, uh, so that anybody who didn't have family and friends to bring them food and wasn't able to go out had somewhere they could go to, to access that kind of support. So all of that uh, support is still in place. And I would say to anybody out there who's in that position or knows somebody who might be in that position, uh, make sure you are aware of that support. I will uh, uh, tweet this afternoon the helpline number um, again, just to make sure that people have access to it because we don't want anybody who's vulnerable due to age or other infirmities uh, not to have access to, to food and the other support that they need. Uh, Paul Malik from The Courier. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, with Test and Protect now in place, will the Scottish Government introduce mandatory testing for all of those leaving institutions, uh, including prisons, care homes and hospitals? Well, in terms of any routine uh, testing we do, we will be guided by clinical advice on that and we keep all of these things under review. And if we change the position on any of that, we will announce that as we, we come to these decisions. Um, test and protect is for symptomatic uh, people, but of course we will also continue to do routine testing for some groups. And uh, obviously the uh, principal focus of that in recent times has been on care homes, uh, but surveillance testing as well uh, will be over and above that. Do you want to say any more about that? No. Uh, Derek Keeley from the Press and Journal. Thank you, First Minister. NHS test side has confirmed it has less than half the staff needed to implement the test and the tech strategy effectively and had to scramble workers from other areas at the last minute. The council leader on the West Nile has not convinced his local health board has the capacity to implement the policy either and has called for urgent reassurances. Can you tell us how many of Scotland's voting health boards do have the correct capacity as of today and what is being done to support those who don't? Uh, well, as I understand it, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong about this, the, the claim around NHS Tayside having half of the capacity they need is based on an analysis that is now two weeks old. Uh, so NHS Tayside have more than 70 contact tracers in place. We have uh, more than a pool, uh, as of now, of more than 2,000 across the country. Uh, we are confident that health boards have what they need given the demand that we assess will be on tests and protect in the, uh, the next period. But any health board who had a greater demand would have the ability to call on resources from other health boards as well. And we are building a, a national um, capacity as well to help with that. So I am confident that the capacity that is needed 
Uh, now is there. In fact, I think there is more capacity there than is needed now. But as I've said many times before, uh, that capacity will continue to have to be flexible in the months to come because, you know, it's, it's an obvious point, but it's worth repeating. The number of tests you need for Test and Protect and the, the number of contact tracers uh, is dependent on the prevalence of the virus. And, and the more we suppress the virus, the fewer people that will have the virus, so the fewer people that will have symptoms and the fewer people that will need tested and their contacts uh, traced. So I'm confident in the position right now. Uh, I'll hand over to Jason Western uh, about Western Isles. Who, uh, but Western Isles have uh, the, the, the test and protect is live in the Western Isles um, and we're confident about that. Western Isles hasn't had a case of COVID for some time, which let's all hope continues to be the case. So yes, I have, my, my team have been in touch with the Western Isles this morning. The Director of Public Health has been spoken to and they are completely reassuring that Test and Protect is intact in the Western Isles and ready. They haven't had a case since the middle of April, so there hasn't been a positive case in the Western Isles for over five weeks. But that does not guarantee they won't get one. So therefore, Test and Protect is up and ready to go in the Western Isles. And there will be a communication today between the National Health Service and the local authority to reassure the local authority that everything is in place that needs to be. OK, thanks. Uh, Kenny McBride from Broadcasting Scotland. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, we've obviously, well, we welcome uh, some of these lockdown relaxations that we're seeing, uh, but we've begun to hear stories of people who are saying they're leaving London and coming to stay with family in parts of rural Scotland. Uh, what is the position of the Scottish Government on that? And if that's not within the, the rules, uh, what can be done to, to deal with people making that journey? Uh, well, I've not heard many of these uh, reports myself, so I, I don't want in my answer here to give any sense that I think this is a, a big problem or a bigger problem than it, than it actually is. Uh, but that's not um, allowed, and it's, it's certainly not what we're asking people to do. Within Scotland, uh, we are telling people, uh, you know, apart from visiting one other household, uh, and to be very mindful of the distances you travel to do that, uh, you stay at home as much as possible. And if you're travelling at all for recreation, you keep within a five mile uh, limit, broadly speaking, of your own uh, home. Because we don't want people going to tourist spots. We don't want people congregating into uh, local uh, beauty attractions uh, because that risks taking the virus into different parts of Scotland. I, I think I said yesterday, and I'll, I'll say it again, I... I, I so look forward to the day when I can stand here and say to people, Scotland is open, please go to our tourist attractions and, and enjoy everything that our beautiful country has to offer. But unfortunately, that is not now. Uh, so please follow the rules. Uh, and that applies to people in Scotland. Uh, you shouldn't be travelling uh, to Scotland except for essential purposes. Um, but if you're not from Scotland and you find yourself for a, an essential reason in Scotland, the rules that are in place in Scotland apply to you while you're here as well. Uh, and lastly, uh, Chris McCall from the Daily Record. Thank you, First Minister. I just wanted to ask, how great is the risk that if most Scots do not follow the guidelines of Phase 1, for example, by inviting people into their homes, that we all find ourselves back under the most strict phase of lockdown again? If people don't stick by the rules and... and act in a way that gives the virus the ability to spread, then it is possible that we would be back in the strict phase of lockdown and be there for longer. And, you know, very different circumstances and, and very different uh, experiences over the past few months of, of COVID. But, you know, Korea right now, we're seeing uh, having opened at schools is closed at schools again because of a rise in the number of cases. So this virus is out there, it hasn't gone away, and it will be looking for any opportunity to spread. And our job is not to give it those opportunities, not to provide those bridges for it to do so. So uh, I, if what you're describing happens, I can't rule out that we go backwards, but I'd rather uh, on this sunny Friday with the first weekend where people can have a little bit more social interaction uh, end on a positive note. If we all enjoy the slight relaxation, but do so responsibly and do so within the rules, then we'll keep heading in the right direction and we can keep thinking about lifting these restrictions, not imposing them again. But that's not just down to me, that's down to all of us. Come back to that central point, never in my lifetime before has this need for collective action, as Jason said, to remember 
that each decision we take will affect all of us. So let's keep doing the right thing and do it for each other as well as for ourselves. Um, that concludes our questions today. Um, can I thank all of you uh, for joining us? Can I particularly thank uh, Fiona and Jason uh, and Rachel, our BSL um, interpreter today? And uh, thank all of you uh, for your forbearance over these past few weeks, but for doing, as I know you will, uh, the right thing in future. Um, there is no doubt uh, that we have made progress, but if we are to continue making progress, uh, then we all have to continue to stick to these rules. So I hope you have a, a happy weekend uh, this weekend, uh, but stick to the rules um, and keep doing the right thing. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>